on uh, staff and everything. I remember he 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 said he's, he was going to resign unless something was done about that, okay. and he did go ahead and uh, uh, decide to resign. And I remember the principal shareholder of Nation. That is the only time I know he flew from Paris. Uh, probably Sada knows this. Flew, flew from Paris, came and landed in Da in his private jet, and now asked requested Ali to come to the airport to have a chat and they had a chat and he stayed on for a little while longer but in the long in the you know after a year he still said you know he didn't think the issues that he was talking about were really being felt and he actually eventually resigned i've not known somebody who, who is more separate and principled as as uh, Ali Fulik was allow me to just uh, read something that i uh, that that uh, I've seen in part of the, his writings when you talk about things like corruption. Here is what Ali had to say in one of the, uh, uh, his many talks. Corruption is the single biggest threat to Africa's growth. The solution lies in good ethical leadership, strong and enforceable laws against corruption. Severe sanctions for corruption crimes are underpinned by a national culture of promoting ethics from family to the national level. That was Ali. That is something that he lived by the minute. That is something that was in his, his DNA. Uh, another quote I have for him is uh, in terms of Africa and where we need to be going. Africa needs to have a boundaries vision of a future that is fantastic to the point of being crazy, leading us to strive to be like the rest of the world, if not better. Africa has what it takes to be a great continent and all that is needed is to imagine ourselves uh, as, as being great. We need not to limit ourselves, but to let ourselves dream big. And uh, finally, I just want to say, read something from, we, we were together, he was a founding uh, chairman of uh, an, an organization called Musingi. And Musingi, and I think that we could have one or two directors of Musingi present, is an institution that was formed to help catalyze industrialization across East Africa. And this is, it was sponsored mainly by Gatsby Foundation and Gatsby is funded by uh, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Sainsbury of UK. Here is what uh, uh, they say from Gatsby. Gatsby and Lord David Sainsbury who funds Gatsby were honored that Ali agreed to become the first chairman of Musingi an ambitious initiative attempting to catalyze the economic sectors of the future for East Africa. Ali brought his energy and strategic vision to Musingi. It captured his imagination and his burning brief belief that East Africa should shine and hold itself to the highest standards and ambitions. Gatsby remains immensely grateful to Ali's leadership and vision. Many joined Musingi, I must say I'm one of them, uh, keen to work with Ali. So it's another organization of footprints he has left in place, carrying on the great work that he started. So ladies and gentlemen, that was Ali Furuki, someone I will miss forever. And I can tell you, even when I was going to join Nation Media Group, I had to fly uh, to, to, to Tanzania, uh, to his home, for him to guide me, for him to talk to me, and uh, really tell me about about whether I should even do it. And uh, we had very long conversations about, about it. And eventually um, uh, I joined and went on to work there for, for, for 10 years. So when I say he was a mentor, he truly was. And I used to say, it's not about the mentor in Tanzania. He was actually the greatest mentor I've ever had. So, uh, but like Shinua Achebe once said, death is a bad reaper because he's always speaking on the unripe fruit. So um, now I would want us to move on uh, to the, uh, the next item. And the next item is um, the introduction video, uh, which is going to you know, talk about the life and times of Adam Furuki. There we go, and thank you very much. Um.
Ali Mufariki was one of the most influential people of his time. He was profoundly committed to his country and to the economic integration of Africa as a whole. Let me start by apologizing. If by the time I'm done talking, you'll be upset, depressed, or even angry. And I'll tell my talk through three short stories. The first I've called simply, Africa is not rising. See, I'm starting to annoy you. Ali Mufariki was born in 1958 in Bukoba village in Tanzania. He was employed by Daimler-Benz and studied in Germany. In 1986, he achieved a degree in mechanical engineering at Reitlingen University. Ali became a friend, a brother. He taught me how to weather the storm of life and the importance of living life of significance. The positive perception of Africa in the business world started maybe five years ago with that famous headline, I think, or cover by economists saying Africa rising again and stuff like that. My success has been much more modest than a lot of people think that seem to over amplify my business success. But I'm not complaining. I think that where I am today um, is a far cry from where I thought I would be uh, when I started out uh, some uh, 24 years ago. Working in Germany was unsatisfying. He needed to move back to his home country and do something significant. He started his own company, Infotech Computers Limited, which installed and maintained computers across Tanzania, supplying both hardware and software. His company, Infotech Investment Group Limited, is a family business based in Dar es Salaam. I am satisfied with what I've achieved, but obviously as I got older and assumed responsibility as a family man, but also as a citizen in a country like Tanzania, I started becoming aware of a much bigger responsibility for me than just personal success. I realized that societies are built by individuals coming together, having uh, a common view on what they think is best for them as they build this society together. And that, uh, that view uh, is shaped by their beliefs, is shaped by their values, is shaped by what they believe to be progress. And I think that is how I slowly but surely kind of drifted into this uh, leadership development enterprise uh, that eventually became Africa Leadership Initiative. The Africa Leadership Initiative has played a key role in developing ethical leaders across the continent. He was a man, I think, of deep humility. Uh, he was a man who believed in values and believed in values-based leadership. I, for one, think it is indeed Africa's time. It should be. This should be Africa's century. We are at the very beginning of this century. I think that a fairer comparison would have been between Africa, a continent of about a billion people, and China in its rising years, about 20 years ago. China had also around a billion people. But if China could rise at 18% at the peak of its rising, why would 6 to 7% be called impressive? Unless, of course, we have accepted a special standard for Africa, a mediocre standard for Africa. In 2012, he joined TMEA's first governance body where his energy and commitment had a galvanizing effect. Before the day is over today, before Africans go to bed later today at some point, Africa will have shipped out more than $80 million in buying pharmaceuticals. Today, just this one day, because Africa can only manufacture less than 2% of the pharmaceuticals it, it, it consumes. 80 million of money we don't have. And it's very easy to be outraged by this number until you realize that of that 80 million, actually most of it is aid. It's not even our money, because the majority of healthcare budgets of most African countries are not funded locally. And here's the thing, because we don't fund our healthcare budget, it means also we don't focus on the healthcare challenges that our communities face, that we face, that are not being researched, that are not being cured, that are not being treated, because we do not own 
our healthcare agenda. We have relegated the most important thing that matters to any human life, health. That's how screwed up our healthcare business is in Africa. My first observation was that this discussion here uh, would uh, have been very effective in leading to the solution if we could separate response to disasters and saving lives and dealing with the aftermath from preparedness. It is much more important, in my view, to enable people to save their own lives, each individual life. Why? Because we will never be able to raise enough money to save all the lives that we need to save. And for every single life that you save, and I congratulate and commend all those who have been in the business of saving life, there are nine lives that are out of your sight that perished. It's never enough. It doesn't matter how much money you give. The disasters are always a hundred times bigger. So I'd like us to look at solutions when how we can provide, uh, create robust systems for preparedness that are actionable at community level. I've been busily tweeting uh, the quotes that I could capture from uh, uh, Professor Pra's uh, presentation. I think it's extremely important to hear someone say that race is a bankrupt idea devoid of any value or a scientific nature. Uh, at a time when everywhere you look, people are talking about race and how important it is and how we should be presently engaged with it. And it's always troubled me. I, for one, think it is indeed Africa's time. It should be, this should be Africa's century. We are at the very beginning of this century. There's still 87 more years to go. The question that I still want us to answer is, are we going to find what we are missing the most today? Which is self-love, love for one another, and solidarity. Do we feel that solidarity for one another? I always admired Ali for his diligence, self-discipline, and intelligence that got him very far. Ali's unique personality was affected by his empathy, open-mindedness, curiosity, trust, and his belief in the good in man. Ali Mufaruki passed away in South Africa on the 8th of December, 2019. He was 61 years old. He survived by his wife and four children. Rest in peace, my friend Ali. Your legacy lives on. He was truly a remarkable human being, humble, approachable, kind and funny. He shall be missed. You're muted. Hey, um, you're on mute, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. I had I had just said what a no some man, and that is just tip of the iceberg. This is a, that kind of 10 minutes show of what a great man we are talking about. Can I take this opportunity now to also just acknowledge the presence of, um trying to get the name properly. Uh, is it Professor Bukinkosi Moyo? 
professor booking course in Moyo. He said like he this. can do yeah? Pardon? Is it in Kosana? Yeah, book, booking Kosi Moyo. Um, it's begging Kosi Moyo. Oh, begging very well. Kosi. Yeah, just uh, acknowledge his, uh, his uh, presence. Uh, and then we move on to the second stage, which is where we are going to uh, have some tributes uh, from the family members uh, <laughs> who, who I must say are all present. Uh, and we shall start with Zara uh, to say a few words. Zara, over to you. Thank you, Linus, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I just want to start off by thanking the MINDS team and Mrs. Grassa Michelle for their dedication to making sure this celebration <laughs> that came to light just in time for his birthday tomorrow. I'd also like to thank all of the speakers and guests who were able to make it today for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be a part of something that's very special to my family and I. Sadly, my mother is not able to speak today, but me and my younger sister, Sophia, will be representing the family. Um, I'm sure you most know my dad as someone who was a straight shooter, intimidating, yet approachable, funny, friendly, and passionate about the development of not just Tanzania, but the African continent. So I'd like to just to give a little bit of insight to who he was to my family, but more specifically to me. Um, growing up, much to how you all know him as someone who stuck to his values and didn't care who was in the room when he was expressing them. That's how he was at home. He had his rules, many about things that we didn't quite understand at times and countlessly tried to debate him on, but we would always be met with, it's easier to say no than yes, so my answer is no. He would always challenge us, which was at times infuriating, but right now I'm seeing how those roles have shaped me into who I am today. And it's given me a sort of ethical grounding that has helped me navigate through my life. I've come to appreciate my dad for never giving us specifically what we wanted. He would always make sure to get us the opposite. I remember asking for an iPhone when I was in high school. He just sighed and said to me, who do you think you are to own a thousand dollar phone? And I was just like, not even for my birthday, dad? He told me to work hard and to buy it for myself. And then this would teach me the real value of money and hard work. I don't know about the rest of my siblings, but I was definitely my dad's favorite. And I'll probably get a mouthful for saying this here today, but one cannot deny the truth. We just had this unspoken bond. We had the same humor. He'd always get annoyed at me at my stupid jokes and lingo, but he'd always laugh and join me in the end. We had our own handshake and he'd always constantly entertain us with dancing videos that he made me swear to never share with the world. Recently last year, <clears throat> I would always end our conversations with, I love you Padre, which was I love you dad in Spanish. And he'd always just respond, I love you too daughtre, just because it sounded similar to Padre. I told, I told him a million times that was not how you said daughter in Spanish, but he never stopped saying it that way. If he forgot to say I love you, he'd always make sure to send a video of him saying it later. It's small things like that that make me miss him more every day. Going to university and heading to Toronto, I'd only come home once a year or every two year, once every two years. And right now I realize how little time I spent with him these last five years. And I often feel regretful about it. But wherever we were in the world, dad always made sure we stayed up to date with everything that he was doing. We had a family group chat on WhatsApp called the Mufurki Family Chat. And to all his friends, I'm sure you know how active dad was on WhatsApp. He loved to send pictures of everything he was doing. And I'm really grateful for that right now. He'd always fill us in on all his business trips, where he, what was going on at home. And I have a thousands of selfies from dad, either at a plane, on a plane or at an airport. It became a kind of ritual he did. He'd always snap a picture of himself wherever he was about to fly somewhere, telling us where he was going, for what, that he loved us and he'd message us when he landed. Um, last January, my dad was attending a conference in Vancouver at my little sister's school in UBC. And I begged him to stop by Toronto, even if it was just for a day so I could see him. And he did. We spent two days together catching up, shopping, complaining about the horrible Toronto weather because honestly, the snow was not stopping. But it also gave me the opportunity to open up to him for the first time about my worries about graduating, still feeling lost about who I was, what I wanted to do in life. I was debating staying in Toronto after graduation for two years. And I knew this was a big no-no to my dad. He always expressed 
his wishes for us to come back home, use the knowledge we learned and gained to develop our own country. This is a hard conversation to bring up for me, especially because it was bad. And I felt like he expected me to come home and at least know what I wanted to do in life after studying abroad for five years. But he sat me down, reassured me, and told me to be confident in myself and my abilities, to not let anybody make me feel less than, and that whatever I was meant to do in life would come with me when the time was right. He still wasn't happy about me working in Toronto, but he told me to figure myself out and to come home ready to be able to work together. His, responses, uh, his response and reassurance just made me appreciate him and everything he was so much more. He was always attentive, although there were times my mom and us kids questioned if he loved golf more than us. Golf became such a big part of his life. Some, I just thought it was a weekend hobby, but it became something that brought him so much joy and friendships. And I'm happy he was able to find this escape away from the very busy life that he led. He always took time to listen to his, our needs, listen to his friends or business partners, was willing to lend a helping hand wherever he could with no intention of receiving anything in return, which is an important characteristic he taught all of us kids to have. I believe that who my dad was and everything he embodied is what allowed him to create such an impact in so many people's lives and to the African continent. Um, a parent is so much part of a child's early life that you can't imagine them not being there. My family and I are still trying to grapple with this new reality. He was our leader, our protector, our confidant. I keep hoping that I'd wake up to messages from him on the group chat. I look back on these last 25 years and I've Though it was short, I thank God for letting me experience this type of paternal love and letting him prepare us to take on this world, even if it is without him now. We miss you every day, Dad. We love you. We promise to make you proud and to keep celebrating you. Happy early birthday. Thank you, everyone, again for being here today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this celebration. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Zara, uh, for those uh, uh, very good words. And it is coming naturally because it is not a speech; it is, it is how you lived with your dad. And uh, and thank you very much. Um, and thank you for for uh, promising to carry on with this legacy, which is one of the greatest things we can all do. And that coming from you is is really a great thing. Uh, I shall now call upon Sophia. And Sophia, as I call you to, to say your bit, please feel free, completely free to disagree with uh, Zara about uh, Zara being the favorite. Yes. Oh, you are that favorite in different ways. Right. <laughs> you oh, are, to you, Sophia. But it's true, Zara and Dad had an undeniable connection when it came to humor. And right. that was very, that was a very funny guy. And, Zara has a lot of that in her as well. Good. Good. Yeah. So I prepared a little something today for you guys. Um, going to do my best not to stutter and show you what I have here. Take your time. It is difficult to explain the ways in which dad was a father to me. It's difficult to write the word. But he would have told me in this instance that I can do this as long as I'm doing my best to be exceptional. And that if I think I cannot, then I'm just being a drama queen. And so for him, I will do my best. Take your time, Sophia. It's no rush. Thank you. Dad fathered me with words. How words sounded, how they, how we choose to punctuate the sentences, and how they move us to hang on to them and reach for more. Ever since I was young, I would share my poems with my dad. And he would often share his speeches, excerpts of his book, and essays. We often would ask one another for corrective notes and praise one another's penmanship. He understood that I love to write and be inspired. I believe he also understood that he raised me to be that way, to understand the potent power of mindfulness in music, in business, 
in everything. That is the intimate and, lo and loving tutoring he gave me, cradling my amateur literature and assuring me that it meant something. And so we took care of each other in that way. It's how we held one another accountable in our dreams. He named his book after a title of a poem I wrote for him nearly a decade ago. And one year ago, I sampled a voice recording of him recording one of my favorite poems that he wrote for my album. My experience with dad was full of art. Earlier, I said the words, earlier I said that words is how we took care of each other, but I must admit that I misspoke. It is how we take care of each other. My dad, daddy to me, Ali to you, honey with an eye to my mom, continues to take care of me with words. I read through my dad's old book of poems that he wrote when he was in college. And just like I knew I would, I found the words he wanted me to read today. On the 25th of February, 1984, daddy wrote a poem that I believe is for me and for us to make sense of days like today. It is called Live Like a Tree, which I will read for you right now. The trees seem to enjoy to live in endless peace. They prosper green during the rainy days with the shining sun. They Their leaves falling to let new ones grow each season, each year. The soft blowing wind with them See, see them rock and swing, showing the direction. The music of the birds nesting on their branches fills you with joy sometimes and makes you sad some other time. On a day like this, I would like to be a tree, to rest my reliable roots in the soft, rich earth. I'm sorry. I would like the rain to fall and the sun to shine on me, not worrying about the bomb, not worrying about tomorrow, just rocking and swinging with the wind, not worrying about the storm that will uproot me, not frightened by lightning that will burn me, not knowing about the drought that will starve me, not scared of the man-made fires that will scorch me, I would rest listening to the music of the birds. I would enjoy God's creation around me. Dad still surrounds me. He encompassed a world of knowledge that is deeply embedded within all who heard him speak. Dad was a dreamer. He dedicated his life to an African ideal. Even in his 60s, he remained a young spirit, feet in the rich soil, hailing from a village in northern Tanzania, Bukoba, with blue eyes and big ideas. He remained stubborn when told no, a beautifully unreasonable man who could reason his way around anything. These days, I dream of him. He is still teaching me. Today we celebrate because Ali is like his poem, a tree rocking and swinging with the wind, wrestling, resting, listening to the music of the birds, enjoying God's creation around him. My elders, colleagues of my father, the good people of minds who have gathered us all here today, his dearest friends whom he considered family. Thank you all so much for today. May the seeds that dad placed in our hearts and minds continue to grow so that we can be like him. Thank you so much. Linus, you're muted.
Is that is that better? Yeah. All right. I was saying thank you very much, Sophia, for those very good words. Um, and I was saying, uh, may those seeds indeed that you planted in each one of us uh, continue to grow and, uh, and help to create that African ideal uh, that Sophie talks about, that we all agree uh, that Ali lived for. Um, it's also very nice to see when you see Sophie and you see Zara talking, you see that Ali is not dead. Ali lives on. Ali lives on. And I, I think all of us will continue to do everything that we can to ensure that his legacy and his dreams are realized in our own, in our respective spaces that we are uh, able uh, uh, to, to, to influence. So now we shall ask, uh, Mohammed was having a bit of a problem with his, uh, his laptop. Mohammed, are you there? Mohammed? If Mohammed is not there because he had told us that he might no, be- No, I'm here, I'm here. You're there, all right, good. Yes, I'm good. here. Over to you. Mohammed is, uh, is a very close friend of the family. Uh, in fact, he is, he, he is family to the, the Mufurukis. And uh, we've had the privilege to be with Mohammed as well as a director of Monarchy Communications, uh, where, Ali was, where Ali was our chair. So, Karibu, Karibu Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Linus. Uh, it's very hard to talk about Ali after this very touching uh, point from Sophia. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to be given this opportunity to talk about my friend Ali. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, someone said, if you want to know a character of a person, you give them power. But in my word, if you wanted to know a character of a person, you put him to the mountain. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because Ali, you all know mountain Kilimanjaro, Ali climbed that mountain and submitted four times. Four times is not normal because when I did it the first time, we were all very happy to have achieved that uh, feat very excited but then when we went on to do it second time third time and fourth time it's as if we had nothing else to do but then in the process of climbing the mountain you get to know the character of a person and i got to know ali uh, very well well as you said my name is mohammed remamu i'm a friend of ali's and uh, i met ali in the early 90s. By that time, we were all grown up. I was married, Ali was married already. Ali was already a successful businessman. And at that time, I was still working for the government. And the time I met Ali, I would say that I was blessed because it is a time when my life was on a crossroad because I needed to decide whether to continue working for the government or to go private. So meeting Ali made my decision very, very easy. And I consider myself blessed because looking back now, nearly 30 years later, I'm not regretting that decision. Ali, Becoming friends with Ali was not too difficult. I wouldn't say it was, too difficult. it was difficult because you all know Ali is a person who, once you meet him, you get a feeling that is giving you 100% attention. And you always feel that you are learning something from him. He was that kind of a person. He will engage you and you feel that he actually understands uh, your point of view and you always leave him knowing that you have learned something. And it was full of knowledge and full of information. Nali and Ali had a very good grasp of almost everything he touched, be it politics, economics, 
anything that he touched by he talked always debated from the point of knowledge research and facts and figures he was a, a, a very captivating storyteller and uh, during our time i remember we had many gatherings and some of the gatherings would go way past midnight and as usual would be a group of people and some of us will have had too much of good stuff but then ali will be the one leading the the debate, the stories. And in the end, because all, Ali always was a stone sober, he never drank, and all of us will end up, uh, he will end up cracking jokes and we're all laughing to the hurting point. Now, Ali, as a family man, I think I have to say this because, uh, as you all know, he left behind his wife Sada, the four kids. Uh, Leila, uh, Zahra, Sophia, and uh, Abdul Razak. Of course, of recent, I've get to, to meet them more often, but it gives me a very, very great joy to see them all growing up into a, a junior citizen, junior people, they are all grown-ups, and they're all growing to be very strong pillar to their, to their mother. It gives me very, very, uh, very happy and, you know, seeing them growing as they are very humble, grounded. I'm very grateful for that. And that is what Ali achieved. I will not go into details of uh, Ali's work. I know most of us who are present here today have worked with Ali in uh, many and the uh, people were able to talk more about Ali than I can do. I knew only knew Ali mostly from social point of view, so I'll end up there. But what I can say is uh, Ali left behind a void that cannot be easily uh, filled. Ali is a person who appreciated life and he always uh, was working towards improving people's lives. And I'm sure wherever he is spiritually, he would want us to continue from where he left. Again, I wish to thank uh, Mandela Institute of Development Studies for organizing this very, very important event. And uh, I hope uh, maybe not, not in this generation, but generations to come, we'll see the Africa that is different from the one we have today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, just there is some music, the background church type of music that is happening. <laughs> Linus, Linus, sorry, I, I had to attend a, a family issue and uh, <laughs> sorry for that. No, I'm saying there's some background music. Uh, because I'm on a, a funeral someone. <laughs> oh, I see. Ah, okay, okay. All right, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry for I, that. I thought, I thought it's somebody who needed to mute their, their, their <laughs> microphone. All right, I understand that, Mohammed. And thank you for, for that. Thank you for, 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 for those bits. And, um, and it's not lost on me that you also, you also conveniently forgot to mention how uh, Ali used to deal with you at the golf course. But uh, I guess that was <laughs> uh, Or maybe someone else will. Um, now, allow me to uh, call someone else who is uh, also a family to the Mfrukis. And that is uh, Ambassador uh, Ami Mpungwe. Ambassador, and oh, I can see he's brother, there. Thank you, Linus. I think uh, Zahra, Sophia, and Mohammed has, have made it difficult for me to intervene at this stage because they all, almost described the way Ali, I knew him, and, and probably here. And I was telling Sada and her children last night that I probably knew Ali much longer than most of you gathered here to, together today. My first contact with Ali was when he came back from Germany, 1987. And uh, we, we never knew each other. And uh, uh, that was the time when uh, uh, he was sent to Germany as a best performing student. Uh, he got a scholarship. He was sent by 
one of the biggest, biggest parastatos in Tanzania National Development Corporation. But when he came back, this was the time the parastatos were, were becoming non-performing and uh, therefore they could not employ Ali. And, uh, and uh, in the process, I got to know Ali uh, to try to assist in getting a job. I was working for the president at that time. And, um, and here he is, a young man who was highly qualified in Germany and he got a job with Demla Chrysler. And yet he decided to come home instead of uh, staying in Germany and keeping that uh, wonderful opportunity as a job, as a career, but also a better paying opportunity and come back to just to be sent that he could, thought that he could not be employed. And in the process, that's when he got the job, his first job was national, with NEDCO, National Engineering Design and Engineering Company. So from there on, we started uh, meeting quite often. I came to discover <laughs> that he was a bright young man. So, and uh, we started uh, having conversations on various issues, uh, which laid the foundation of uh, our getting to know, to becoming very close friends for about 34 years until he passed on last year. So he was not only he was not a friend. To me, Ali was not a friend. He was a brother, and uh, and uh, both his family, from the time he was courting and dating uh, Sada to the time they got married and had their children, as well as um, on the part of my family, the two families got very close together, and even today, our children are still very close friends. Mm. So. And even when he started business, we, we had started business together. But uh, Ali being on the private sector, he was more free to do business. But uh, after a while, we realized that uh, business, uh, doing business together was not a good idea for us. <clears throat> and we decided, we thought uh, uh, it may spoil our, our personal relationship. And, uh, and I'm sure Sada would remember uh, when we decided to live together, uh, to leave business aside and uh, remain very good friends, very close friends, we even took our families to Sudan um, in, 19, in year 2000. Uh, Sada would remember that, and the kids were still young, and uh, Ali's late father was there, and I had my family there. So we thought that was uh, to open a new chapter that we are not doing business together, but we are. We are friends, and we took that opportunity for him and I and our families to bond. And that has been uh, the character of our relationship uh, uh, until his last day. And in the process, which really brought us together, was uh, was uh, discussions on a range of issues of uh, importance to our national development as well as African continent. And uh, at that time, I come back from. A saint in 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 Lusaka. I was uh, I've always been in the foreign service, and uh, that was the time I, after the liberation. Now I'm glad to see Mrs. Michelle there and uh, Dr. Moyo. That was after liberation of Mozambique and Angola, and uh, we were and then uh, of Zimbabwe, and then the processes for Namibia and, and Southern Africa and South Africa had uh, picked up pace. So Ali and I would meet on various occasions to discuss about the change processes in Tanzania and the developments within the Southern African region and, and the continent. So that has laid the foundation for long-term uh, exchanges. Uh, Ali, whenever he had an idea or a policy consideration about Tanzania, about the region, about the continent, he would drop home. He didn't need it to make any appointment, and I would do the same. So uh, he was a sparring partner in terms of ideas. I would come in with my old fashioned ideas, and Ali would bring in 
is young ideas and we'll uh, have conversation for, for, for hours, just two of us. And, uh, and, uh, and that has been a, the story of a relationship. And uh, in the process, I come to admire Ali's intellectual capacity and uh, personal, uh, unquestionable high level of personal integrity and, uh, and honesty and, uh, and whatever Ali would tell you, you could take it to the bank. You would not doubt it. And, uh, and uh, sense of discipline, timekeeping, and, uh, and all that. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that I think it was Zara or Sophia who mentioned about many people don't know about Ali's love for, for art, for, for poetry. And uh, photography was his, uh, I think, his biggest hobby. You know, Ali, whenever he was free, Ali would walk around with his big camera, and uh, and uh, and that was his, his hobby. But uh, the biggest thing we used to, use to bring Ali to to highest level of uh, uh, of pleasure was uh, to have an intellectual discussion on policy issues across the board. Uh, would be, be it investment, be it trade, be it environment, be it health. And all of us here, I'm sure we have uh, been in, interacting with Ali on those issues in one way or another. So just as we have avoided uh, uh, doing business, even when in our different responsibilities as uh, uh, leaders in, uh, in various corporate uh, uh, Organization and uh, in particular, when Ali was chairman of Vodacom, I was chairman of uh, of Tigo. Uh, when Ali was chairman of uh, Zuku, uh, I was chairman of uh, of uh, Multi Choice. But never in our many conversations we would touch those areas that uh, we felt would 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 differ. So. I, I don't recall at any moment that we were discussing those areas that uh, we had different perspectives, uh, either um, intentional or because of the nature of the business that we are doing. So he has been a friend, he has been a brother, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to see Sada, you know, uh, holding the fort, keeping the family together, and uh, uh, Leila, Zahara, Sophia, and Tegenya are together. Uh, it gives me a lot of uh, comfort to, to see that the family, uh, much as it is going through a very trying moment, but uh, it's, it's still keeping together. And to see a range of friends, all of you gathered here together today, um, uh, celebrating Ali's very productive life, very, very useful life to, to the cause of humankind in Tanzania and for our dear continent of Africa. Thank you so very much for the organizers of this occasion. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that and for those words. And you can, we can tell, you know, they are not words that you are reading. They are you're just it's a reflection of the relationship, the close relationship that you had with Ali. And indeed, it's good to also see that how the way you describe the family and how they're together. And by the way, Sophie, I hope you can get that that uh, that uh, that poem, I, I really would want to 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 frame it. It's really very insightful and actually quite describes uh, in many ways the kind of man Ali was. Um, allow me now to uh, take this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Mama uh, Grasha Machel. Uh, Mama had said that we don't actually don't spend a lot of time uh, doing her CV, which is very very kind of you. So that you can focus on the celebration of, uh, of Adam Furuki. And therefore, even the subsequent speakers, if I don't uh, spend a lot of time on, uh, on your CV, please understand. I think I've taken the cue from her. So, however, let me say that uh, Madame uh, Gracia Machel is the, is the chairperson of MITES, which is the one that has put this together. So, uh, we thank you very much. We also thank the whole fraternity. Uh, of minds for, for really uh, 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 bringing this together and uh, to celebrate Ali. Uh, so over to you, Madam, and once again, welcome. In Kenya, we say Karibu Sana, 
<laughs> Even in Tanzania, actually. In Mozambique, yes. too, you can say Karibu Sam. <laughs> oh, right. oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we are one people. Sada, Leila, Zara, Sophia, Abdullah Zarak, Razak, I'm sorry. Uh, I greet you on behalf of uh, MINDS, an organization I have the honor of chairing now. And I'm greeting you with all my colleagues. Some of them are here, board members. I see some of our advisors, uh, mm -hmm. Trevor Manuel, Francis Daniel, and others who are around. We decided to organize this uh, event because we felt we couldn't um, wait much longer. We had wanted to have come to Dar es Salaam. The intention was to be with you, to see you eye to eye, to embrace you, to share with you the deep sense of loss, but also a deep sense of love for Ali. And we thought perhaps the COVID uh, pandemic would be short. So we would be able to travel and to have this celebration in person with you. But uh, the time is going on and it was also with the agreement of the family that uh, perhaps the best time it's precisely when we are to celebrate his birth, his birthday, which will be tomorrow. So we are here with you with quite a number of friends to celebrate Ali's life. And in mind's understanding, this celebration is not to be an event because the events come and go. But what are the values which we learned and we, we drank from Ali are to remain with us and we'll be celebrating him in every effort minds will continue to do. We don't celebrate him because he's simply uh, a board member. It's particularly and especially because he is a valued and valuable member of our family. His thinking, his ideas, his approach to life, his approach to development, his dreams and the way he looks at our continent and the world, these are things which are to remain with us. And uh, Ali's life will remain so as a reference and inspiration for the work of our organization. But we want to thank you, the family, for his life and for allowing us to organize with your inputs uh, this, uh, this first celebration, if I can put it this way. I welcome also on behalf of the organization all close friends, some of you, you consider Ali a brother or a sister. There are lots of colleagues around, people he worked with in different positions which he occupied in life. But there are also young people who are his mentees. And I would like to welcome them and to inspire them to take this celebration as a, a starting point to reflect and say, what are the lessons of this life? What does it mean to us, you as young people? So I would address and perhaps leave the ball 
more especially to young people. It also happens that our organization focus on, on youth. And I'm not going to take you through because we have no time. But um, I believe whoever is to value a life will value it if you take it with you for the future. And that future is the young people who interacted with him, the young people who learned from him, as I'm calling them, his mentees. And that's the best celebration we can uh, provide to Ali's life is to take it to the future, to inspire us and to make sure that we transform our nations, our continent and the world as it has been the embodiment of Ali's life. I wanted to refer why I say Ali is a, a valued member of our board. From the beginning when he established Infotech in the 80s, those days, I mean, thinking of uh, computers and how computers are to reshape the world of communication, the world of business, the way how we come together and we interact. It means you have a vision. It did not happen simply, I believe, simply because he wanted to make money. He wanted, Ali wanted to make a contribution in a field which would define very deeply the development of our continent, but the development of the world as well. So he is a visionary. Ali also decided to establish the Africa Leadership uh, Initiative. It shows how he is so strategic in thinking what most our continent needs. And when I say continent, I mean our nations, our countries, our people. Africa is until today really struggling, struggling in terms of uh, what ethical leadership is, what uh, leadership for service, leadership which is committed to the well being of every single citizen of our continent. And Ali was visionary enough and strategic enough to say the best of contribution one can do is exactly to engage young and old to think together and to work together, to strategize together and to see how we can collectively contribute to transform the lives of our people and to transform who we are as Africans, but also to transform the way we want the world to, to know us, not how the world is painting us, but how we are and we want the world to know us. The Africa Leadership Initiative, in my view, because it has uh, left very deep seeds in those who became part of it, not only those who are members of Ali, but those who have been impacted by the members of Ali. So the implication is that it has a multiplying effect in influencing the minds the options and choices of Africans, the way they want to be and the way they want to be understood as Africans, including, including reclaim our identity and our own history. And here I will mention one of the ways in which Ali has influenced us as minds. It was through the African Heritage Program. I won't go into detail what it is, but it's precisely to say, but who, who are we? 
who we used to be even before we were colonized, because now we are known mostly as Portuguese speaking, English speaking, French speaking Africans, but we are ourselves with our own identity and our own dignity. But more importantly, how our own being has to influence today and tomorrow what Africa and Africans are. And Ali was very intense in the engaging our board on issues of uh, African heritage. And I see the link here of uh, our intention really to reclaim African identity and dignity, but we, with him influencing young generations in the type of leadership our continent needs. And then I finally would like to mention also one of the issues that was very deeply involved uh, uh, lastly, which is this uh, Africa uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. He worked very intensely, I mean, to engage, particularly from the business side, to us to understand that this is an opportunity to break uh, the consequences of the Berlin conference, opening all the possibilities. It's not about trade. It's about us communicating with one another, trading with one another, enriching one another, what we produce to be available to other Africans and what we are to be experienced by other Africans. And he worked very intensely uh, to engage business community, but also the, uh, particularly the head of states to understand that this is an opportunity where politics, business, and social has to come together really to redefine Africa. And as I'm saying is a contribution even of undoing the Berlin uh, conference. And I remember seeing him speaking, I think it was in Mauritania in one of the last, uh, summit of African Union, how he was speaking so passionately about the importance of, uh, of this uh, free trade for Africa. But it, is, it links very well with our work because it shows how a Pan-Africanist he was. Many will have mentioned how he was a Tanzanian, he was East African citizen, he was African, but it, the whole concept of being Pan-Africanist, anything you do, you have to take Africa in its totality as a home for all of us. And it, I believe that we owe him as well this contribution which he made to the continent, but which will inspire minds in continuing some of the programs we have started already including the regional integration program, which we have. And uh, so to celebrate for us is uh, to stop a bit, have uh, an opportunity with all those who have been influenced by Ali for us to gain a better dimension of who is this, uh, brother of us, who is this colleague of ours? And if we had to continue to inspire ourselves in the role he played in our organization, what other aspects of his life should enrich our thinking? And it was uh, mm. so moving, I mean, to listen to, to the children, really moving to hear how as a father, he would mentor his children the same way he would take time to his mentees with the Africa Leadership Initiative. But I, I just remember how even during our board meetings, Ali would take his cup of tea or coffee and go to our kitchen to talk to our young people because all our staff are very young here, just to have an opportunity to interact with them and to listen to them, to ask questions, to influence them, and sometimes even to suggest to them what books they should read. Can you imagine, I mean, 
he just came for a board meeting, but he wouldn't miss an opportunity. I mean, to say, who are these young people? And to cultivate their minds and the values and dreams he has he had for our continent. So we are really very grateful that many uh, colleagues of his are here, are going to share with us their perspectives about Ali's life. And I want to end saying, for mind celebrating Ali's life, it is going to become a reference in his thinking. And I want to end saying, Ali is a thinker. And perhaps we will ask also the assistance of the children whenever we need some of the very simple things he would say in his way, but which are so, so profound and which we should take and to consider in our work when we, we are with, the, with the young people as well. So we'll inspire ourselves in his thinking, in his dedication, in his commitment to try and to engage young people who are, for instance, in our scholarship program, to have Alimufuric's thinking as part of how they should train themselves to become better Africans for the future. Thank you to all of you. And I'm sure my boss, who is the founder of our organization, who is going to be speaking next, will uh, uh, express much better why, for instance, he made of uh, uh, Ali a founding member of MINDS. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in other celebrations which we can plan together. And please, if you have to the opportunity to organize your own celebration, for instance, which will focus on MINDS, I mean, sorry, Ali in business. Please invite us, we'll be, we'll be happy to, to join you. If the early uh, family decided to celebrate him, to go deep on how he influenced these hundreds and hundreds of young people, please invite minds, we'll be happy to join you because that's the best way of keeping him alive and keeping him with us. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mama. Uh, that was very, very good. Uh, very um, captured uh, Ali, really particularly as a Pan-Africanist. Uh, I remember when he was, the, the, the conversation was happening in Rwanda. He was very passionate about the fact that it's not just about trade. It's actually opening the doors to our brothers across the continent for, for politically, socially, culturally, and he was very strong on the fact that we are actually one people who just happen to have uh, those, those geographical borders. So thank you very much. And thank you again for also introducing the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Nkosana, Nkosana Moyo. And uh, I will again not go into the details, uh, but he has a very, very rich CV. Uh, but for this purpose, I'll say he's actually uh, a founder of, uh, of MAIDS. He's also a patron of uh, uh, NEPAD uh, Business Foundation. And uh, Dr. Moore is arguably one of the you know, greatest minds that, uh, that we have uh, in this continent. Uh, somebody who has a PhD from Imperial College uh, uh, in London. So Karibu San, Dr. Dr. Moy. And I'm now taking the use of Karibu San uh, liberally because I hear it is quite uh, well known down south. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linus. Uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, fellow colleagues in minds, uh, our chair, Mrs. Michelle, who has just spoken. And we've got a couple of members uh, who are on the advisory board, uh, Trevor Manuel and Francis Daniels, and an informal uh, advisor, if you like, who was there right from the beginning, uh, Dr. Uh, Tem Bayungosi uh, Moyo, he was mentioned earlier on, he is a very close associate of mine. And then the people, who of course, do the work, not, not the people who are in the background, but where they find Karin and uh, Karatilwe. Thank you very much, and I acknowledge uh, all the work you've done in putting this together. And let me also 
thank the family, the Mufuruki family for allowing mines and all of the people present to be part of the extended Mufuruki family, if I may put it that way. Thank you very much for allowing us into that space. And specifically to Zara and Sophia, thank you for even bringing us into your living room by sharing very personal anecdotes with us. We appreciate that. That's the man Ali was, and I'm glad that you felt free to share all of those aspects, very personal and family aspects with us. And on that note, I would like to confess that I'm one of the golf offenders who at every opportunity would accompany him to the golf course. So I guilty as charged, if you like, on, in that respect. So Ali, the man, why was Ali uh, appropriate to be a founding trustee of mines? In many ways, what you've heard from Mrs. Marshall and from the people who've spoken before me really says it all because mines is about all of the attributes of Ali that people have talked about. Somebody who believed not only in himself, he believed in his country, he believed in his continent, but in a very balanced way, he did not believe in his country and continent to the exclusion or to the lack of understanding how important the global village was. So he was able to believe in these things but also to embrace our place in the global village, if you like. That's why you find him as a board member of the Aspen Institute. So he clearly <clears throat> had a, a balanced view of the fact that we can be, we should be proud of who we are, but also be clear that we are part of the greater family of humanity. We should not exclude ourselves from that. But I think we need to maybe pay quite a bit of, especially the younger people. Because in many ways, our continent, as Ali himself articulates in the video, is not performing incredibly well. A lot of young people are seduced to leave the continent. And Zara, by the way, your father shared with us a little bit about your conversations when you were you didn't really want to come back from Canada. I think you represent the challenge that a lot of our young people face. And yet your father shows you the way in spite of succeeding and working in Germany and being employed in Germany as a young and successful professional, he still believed in himself sufficiently and was confident enough to say, I'll go back and be part of building my society, my building my country and my continent. And I think it's okay for all of us to celebrate Alice's life. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to ask ourselves what the big takeaway, as Mrs. Marshall said. We need to take away from how Ali lived his life and implement in our own lives how we're going to build the continent going forward. We need to take on his agenda and carry it forward and implement it. So that's the man Ali was. Now, you again heard about the issue of uh, the, the trade, the, the African trade uh, agreement. Ali understood that although he was Tanzanian and he was very proud of being Tanzanian, he understood that Tanzania was going to succeed and be stronger. In fact, carrying over from how Tanzania contributed to the liberation struggle, because Tanzania understood, going all the way back to Nyerere, that no African country was free until all of the African, other African countries were free. And the Ali was true to that understanding when it also came to economics. Africa will not build a strong economy. Individual African countries will never build individual separate economies that are globally strong unless Africa understands as a whole to build a singular African economy in order to be competitive in the global village. 
Ali lived his life, illustrated him the way he lived his life, that he understood this intimately. And again, a big takeaway for all of us, a big takeaway for the young people in particular. The issue of governance, Ali was a role model. And the part of why Ali was important as a trustee for Minds is because Minds is trying to demonstrate through how it conducts its business, not just theorizing about these concepts. And therefore, the people who are representing, who are present here today representing Minds, every single one of them, and Ali included, are epitomes, if they epitomize what we aspire to do. When we talk about building institutions, when we talk about governance, when we talk about role models, all you have to do is look at these people. Look at Francis Daniels, look at Mrs. Marshall, look at Trevor Manuel. You will see in the way they conduct themselves what the institution stands for. When you look at Alice's life, you will see in the way he lived his life what mind stands for. Therefore, it becomes easy. You don't get any dissonance between the people who represent the idea and the platform and how they conduct themselves in their everyday lives. That's how it should be. And that's why it also becomes easier for younger people to look at this and understand the concepts because the concepts can be seen crystallized in the way the people who represent the institution conduct themselves as Ali did. I want to go back to the issue of uh, the biggest challenge that I think we have in many ways. How we can integrate understanding, believing, being proud of ourselves, our societies and our continent and not being seduced to envy not only envy, but then almost like get subsumed by societies which appear to be more advanced today. And again, go back to the, to the little uh, film that uh, the team put together. Ali understood that all of these societies which we admire today are where they are because individuals within those societies came together, found each other, built institutions which encapsulated, if you like, what they, they worked together to create this reality. We tend all too easily to be persuaded to now go to these countries and these institutions and they not commit ourselves to build our own societies, our own countries and our own continent. That's taking the easy way out. These countries, if you just study a little bit of history, you will notice that every single one of them, without exception, at some point in time in the past, they were exactly where our continent is, and sometimes even worse. Therefore, if we understand this, we need to embrace much more easily building our own countries, our own societies, to a point where we can say, not to be, in fact, not to be the same as they are today, there are still lots of issues that these countries, they've, in my opinion, got wrong. We've got an opportunity to learn from their mistakes and build even better societies, better countries, a better continent. And I think Ali has done his bit in setting us on the way to achieving that, provided we don't stop at simply celebrating his life, but take it as a responsibility, our responsibility to continue on the journey that he started and accept also that we build foundations, we lay our own brick on the wall so that the following generations can have a foundation upon which to build exactly the same way that Ali has done for us. I do not want to necessarily take the 10 minutes because I, I don't think it's necessary. A lot has been said about Ali. Ali's life is very illustrative of all of the things I think we should be taking away. But my last comment would be, let's not be satisfied in admiring Ali. 
the biggest honor we can do early is to continue the fight, to mm. commit ourselves to continuing the journey we started. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moyo, uh, for that. And um, I, I, like, I like your analogy about minds. What you are in minds is really what you are out here. And uh, I think that is uh, Ali. In fact, he used to say sometimes what you speak, what you do speak so loud, I don't hear what you say. Uh, maybe to tie up uh, this uh, bit of uh, minds, uh, can I just ask uh, Professor Bekinkoso Moya to just say hello to the family? And after that, I'm going to hand over uh, the next session to Catherine Rose uh, from Tanzania, who is going to coordinate uh, a conversation with the uh, early fellows from different parts of the continent. So, Professor Moya, just uh, a word to the family. Thank you, Linus, um, and thank you very much for giving me a short opportunity to say a few words during this time when we celebrate Ali's values in life. Uh, it is not surprising for us to hear the words that were uttered by his children, uh, because Ali was a phenomenal person. He had a way of touching one's life. I, I really don't want to embarrass my colleague Kirativa. <clears throat> I wanted the family to know that uh, it took just less than five minutes between Ali and Kiratilwe. Um, most of you would have known her as Belinda, but after those five minutes talking to Ali, she changed her name and became Kiratilwe. Uh, she can speak for herself and explain how that happened, but the, the way in which Ali uh, touched people's lives, it didn't take really long to, for, I mean, for that to actually, his influence to rub on people. So I just wanted to thank the family uh, thank everyone else who has attended uh, the, I mean, this event. Uh, and lastly, to end by saying something unique happened to us. Ali was a friend, not just to Minds, but also to the Vets Business School and the Center on Philanthropy and Social Investment. You saw that he, he attended and spoke on some of our events. Uh, on one of his events or trips to South Africa, attending a board meeting for Minds and the CAPSI um, African event, uh, 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 Africanness event. He flew in on the evening of the 7th of November and he left on the 9th of November back to Dar es Salaam. And I'm sure um, the family would remember this that he flew in back to South Africa on the 7th of December uh, and he flew out on the 9th of December to his final resting place. And that for us is something that was so unique, the coincidence of the dates and everything just told us about what he meant to everyone. Uh, and so I just want the family to, to know that uh, Ali was everything to everyone, depending on who you speak to, somebody has a story to tell about Ali. And so from, from the Vest Business School, uh, from the Center on Philanthropy and Social Investment, we want to thank the family, recognize the work that uh, Ali has done. He was our friend, he will continue to be our friend. And as Mrs. Marshall said, uh, our hope is to continue these conversations and embed them even in academia among others. Uh, and finally, because Mrs. Marshall and Dr. Moy have spoken, I also wanted to recognize Dr. Jomuke, who is also a, a member of, a board member of mine, who is also attending uh, um, the, the, the memorial. So thank you very much, Linus, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to Catherine Rose. And uh, if we get time in the head, I'm not sure we will, but if we do, I would like to hear how uh, Kiratire lost one of her names. But over to you, Catherine, right now. Asante Sana, Linus. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Africa Leadership Initiative, discussion on leadership and lessons we've learned from Ali in the years that we've known him. My name is Catherine Rose Loretto. I'm an Ali East Africa Fellow from Tanzania, and I'd like to introduce our panel this afternoon. We have Leila Masharia, who is also a Fellow from East Africa and the current board chair of Ali East Africa. Leila is a serial entrepreneur and angel investor and the non-executive director at the Africa Digital Media Group ABSA Kenya and Centrum Investments. We also have Ralph Friese with us this afternoon. Ralph is an Ali South Africa Fellow and the Director of Ali South Africa. And we have, and I'm sorry, Kweku, if I say your name wrong, 
we have Kweku Serchi Ado, who is the director of Ali West Africa, um, and is also the communications consultant to the Ghanaian president, Nana Akufo Ado, and chairman of the board of the National Communications Authority. Good afternoon and welcome to our panel. So let's get into the crux of leadership on our continent. I think we can all agree 2020 has been a tumultuous year, globally, regionally, personally. While it has shown us our shortcomings, it has also highlighted our strengths as a people. So Laila, can we start with you? Could you share your reflections on leadership across our continent in the recent period as you see it? Thank you, CR, and it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you, celebrating our dear friend uh, on his birthday. Um, you asked us to reflect on this year and what it means for leadership, not just uh, in Africa, but in the world. And for me, I want to share a quote that has been uh, a source of strength for me over time, but also a way that it can help us reflect on uh, Ali's legacy and his life. And this is it, it's from Pirke Aboth, Ethics of the Fathers from the Jewish Talmud. You are not required to finish the work, but nor are you permitted to desist from beginning. And there's another way that they put it. You do not have to finish the task, but nor are you allowed to abandon it. This saying tells us as leaders many, many things, and it says special things to me. For one, it says that there's an acceptance that leadership, especially in the face of challenges like we have seen this year, is undergirded by virtue and that virtue is its own reward. It suggests the idea of collective work, that somebody plants the tree Somebody else waters it, somebody else prunes it, and somebody else will be the one who sits under its shade. This is very, very challenging for us as leaders because we're working on social change and economic development, pushing the political reforms that we all know, and especially this year we have seen across Africa, that we still have some work to do. But what we are told is that just because we have started today, doesn't mean that we will see the fruits of our labors right away. So it speaks to the collective nature of our work, that all of us are contributing different things to this tree that we are trying to see grow. It also speaks to the incremental nature of the work, that each percentage point, let's say in child, uh, or reducing child mortality, or moving towards political development, to what we come to fruition. But the place where I think really that there will be moments when you're overwhelmed, there will be moments when you want to abandon the task. When it speaks of abandonment, it recognizes that there's a challenge. And it also speaks to us of struggle. This year, what I have really seen and thought about in looking at the challenges to leadership all over the world is that as you cultivate virtue and struggle, it is not only the way we talk about the societies we want to change, looking outwards. We have seen that leadership, inner leadership, the virtue that an individual has can be the difference between life and death for other people. It's the difference between whether or not we tackle climate change from which we're hearing that the, that the clock is running out. It can be the difference in whether or not equity in our society becomes just something we talk about or something that we see delivered. And so this idea that we must struggle to build more virtuous societies, but always start as a leader with yourself. Because this year we have seen the difference between leaders who have personal virtue and those who are just looking outside and finding fault with what is outside them or trying to signal virtue without really doing the hard work of building those values inside oneself. So you are required, you are not required to finish the work, nor are you permitted to desist from beginning. And what we have seen is that 
in the work that Ali started, we need to look and see in which ways are we carrying on watering that plant, pruning that tree so that future generations may sit beneath it. Thanks. Thank you, Laila. Th thank you for bringing to the forefront that this is a journey. Um, and one person starts it and the rest of us have the opportunity to continue to do the work and to contribute to the work. Ralph, can I ask you to step in and share your reflections on leadership? Well, first let me say that many people plant that tree <laughs> and many people will sit under the shade. And working together is what um, brings power and community to the, the things that we do. I was asked to look at a couple of lessons a couple of reflections on this here. And for me, the world does not change one person at a time. It changes as networks of relationships discover or create common cause and a vision of what is possible for us all. This describes actually the second of my lessons gleaned from this very interesting year. It comes from the, the realization that in every intervention, applying the connections within Ali and between Ali and other networks delivered more than any big man personality could. The first on my list is actually that we have to get real. Only honest, accurate assessments enable efficient delivery. Don't avoid the negatives. Don't miss, don't skip the difficult conversation. Know your history and ask the best possible questions. The third for me was scale matters. Feeding a thousand hungry people is wonderful, but when millions are starving, that's not enough. Changing systems becomes essential and is eminently possible because we have so many energetic, bright people. And note I didn't say young people, bright people on this continent we need to be linked to each other to multiply their influence. Ali Mafaruki functioned as a node in a set of networks, as is demonstrated by what people have been saying today. And we must emulate his work and his intervention and build on that example. My last lesson, my last point, is we have to remember Franz Fanon. He argued correctly that changed consciousness is a prerequisite for social change. To shift consciousness, we have to know our history. We must be aware of the psychosocial processes that we as a continent are immersed in, and we must hold on to hope. Because without hope, there's no leading light that takes us to a better future. Ben Okri asked, how can we make real in our lives and in our art the finest possibilities of the African spirit? How can we unleash our genius for the betterment of Africans? This is our task. So for me, the four lessons are get real, lose the big man model, scale matters, and change consciousness is essential to systemic change. But just over a hundred years ago, Pavel Milyukov, that is in November 1916, asked his colleagues in the Russian Duma, their parliament at the time, is it stupidity or is it treason that stops you doing the right thing? Maybe we should be asking this question of our political leaders. And I think maybe we should ask this question of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Said in true Ali fashion to examine yourself first yeah. um, as a leader, go in, look internally first. Thank you so much. Kweku, would you like to jump in now? And so I learned something really interesting about Kweku actually just last night is that Kweku was actually the last person to do an autobiographical interview with former president Jerry Rawlings. 
So Taifu, I hope you will bring in some of that thought into this as well. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, and uh, happy to be with everyone, especially the family of Ali Mufuruki, whom we uh, celebrate, whose life we celebrate uh, today. Um, my uh, quote is from uh, the Bible. It's from Luke 10, 2. And it's simply that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And you may define uh, the harvest as the labor, the work that lies before us uh, that requires uh, tackling. The spectatorship is large. The stadium stands are failed. Um, social media glitters is, is, is a flame, is a wash with clever, intelligent material from smart people, young and old, um, throughout the continent, throughout Africa. And that is fantastic. It's fantastic that everywhere on the continent that we have a, a, a culture um, of silence that, that pertained in decades past, giving way to a, a new culture, yielding to a festival, a celebration of fundamental freedoms. Um, this year, we've seen a series of uh, elections taking, taking place across the continent. In Ghana, we have elections in just a few weeks. We've had elections in Tanzania. There's been elections in Ivory Coast and, uh, and, and, and uh, Guinea, and, and there's, there are more to come. Of course, the quality and substance, substance of it is evolving. It's, it's a road we're traveling. It's far from perfect. But now it's time to transition from the ranks of the commentarati. It's time to transition, move from uh, commentary to participation and to action. Um, it is a bleeding shame, a wound on our collective conscience that so many young people especially wash up on the shores of Europe, dead or alive, it doesn't matter, looking for better, a better life, looking for opportunities, but they end up, uh, you know, doing nothing more than wiping Europe's bottom. We have a responsibility to invest in education for our young people to acquire knowledge and skills so they can contribute meaningfully to their communities, to our society, so they can live in dignity and participate in growing our economies. There's a saying in Akan that we translate as when, you have, when your fingers are in the bowl, they cannot eat without you. Um, <coughs> better tool for recruiting skillful, capable laborers to the harvest than educating our young people. We cannot spare any resource in ensuring that we do that. Otherwise, we do not have a future. That future that Ali Mufuruki sought uh, for all of us, for which he worked, for himself, for his children, for his community, for his country, and for our continent. Yes, I did that interview with Jerry Rawlings. It was interesting. Um, he's a man, he's a two, he's a, like a, a coin, two-sided. He did good, uh, but he also left uh, trails of of blood, um, 
but I believe that deep inside he meant well. I think his execution went wrong. But as I say, there's enough commentators. We need laborers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prepper. Wow, uh, a lot to unpack. And I'm, I'm definitely coming to you with a question. Um, but I'd like to go to Laila with something that you said that really, I think as Ali leaders across the continent, and as we think about the tree we're building and the shade we're building, that we get tired. And being a leader is lonely some days, it's tiring. You know, Ralph spoke to these nodes and networks that we can lean into for support. How do we keep going when we are challenged and we want to abandon the task? Where do you draw your strength from? And, you know, and how can, where, where should we be looking for our strength? Thanks, Sayar. I think the biggest, uh, the, the biggest opportunity, there's two levels. As we say, and everybody has said in this panel, a lot of the work is internal and it's spiritual. And there's not one path that one should take in order to renew themselves. For some people, it's family, it's walks in nature, it's the the good word or the different scriptures that exist, whatever your faith tradition is. Uh, but these are all different ways in which you renew yourself and keep yourself able to wake up the next day and going. But the other insight that has come out of this panel is really this idea that collective action has strength in itself. That by leaning on your network, on people who are like-minded, just as we are here, is the kind of thing that allows you to continue step in front of the other towards the goal that you have. And those are the two ways in which leaders balance the two, the external and the internal, to keep their energy up and to keep their eye on the prize. Thank you, Laila. So my next question is for all three of you, Ralph, Koko, and Laila. Um, how do we go from, you know, commemorati, as Koko said, to action? How do we grow socially conscious people on our continent you know, how do we execute with value? How do we live these values-based leadership and ethics that we talk about in our seminars, you know, that we, where we want to hold each other accountable across the continent? And how do we do it in a world that is juxtapositioned with immediate gratification and social media? So, you know, Kweko, when you talked about, you know, social media, you know, is awash with clever, intelligent people, how do we, how do we bring those two together? Um, and what are your thoughts of moving from commentary to action? Whoever wants to go first. I think that for, for us, building an understanding of where we come from, both individually and socially, is vital to provide the base from which to work. And we, we try to do this for the individual fellows and for the networks as a whole. The, that then leaves a space where in trusted circles, we challenge each other to act practically. And so I know we're not supposed to talk about COVID during today, but in South Africa, we launched three new organizations during COVID in direct response to what uh, we were facing, and those have gone on to deliver. And that comes from um, taking strength from the future. Because for me, if the future, um, the future has to be good. It has to be better than the present. And looking at that vision, that hope of what we have, gives me the strength to work today. And so when we challenge each other, um, having recognized weaknesses, um, we have changed regulation, launched new organizations in wellness and in education and the like. And that comes from the strength of having the shared experience and trust that comes from the network that we build. I know we have limited time. You know, these things we could talk about forever. Thank you, Ralph. Kweku, do you want to step in? So I'll keep it simple. Um, we have to multiply leaders. We have to replicate leaders. 
in the mold of the man we celebrate today. Um, there isn't a better way to do that than leadership by example. Modesty, self-respect, the things our mothers told us. Um, the things we must do so our children are not ashamed of their surnames. We must recruit young people to be like Ali Mufuruke. By Lila, doing anything oh, as we speak. Thank, Thank you. you Lila, I'll give you the last word. That's powerful. I think uh, what Ali, the leadership initiative exists to do is to replicate those leaders, to highlight the values we want leaders to have and to push back against that commentating culture. We know that leaders need reflection, spaces for reflection is what I mean, that they need refreshment, but also that they need exhortation. They need to be reminded because as they fatigue, it is easy to become passive or even to join the commentating class. So our entire purpose is pushing leaders back into the arena and trying to equip them so that they're able to continue this path that we started working with them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ralph, Kweko and Lila for, for your insights, for your reflections, for, for hard questions that we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing? How are we moving this commentary to action as leaders across the continent? How are we, how are we keeping these nodes, these different nodes moving and creating more synergies within the different um, networks across the continent? And you've given us really a lot to dwell on in terms of our own narrative. I would like to end our session with a quote, um, just thinking about Ali's reflections at the African Union Summit for the enactment of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, you know, that we continue to strive to influence policy change and take actions, take the big steps needed to propel our continent into impact and prosperity. So I'm not sure when Ali said this, I think the first time I heard it was like circa 2013, but I do recall having heard it, you know, quite a bit in different forms coming from him. So Ali said, Africa wants a lot of things, but needs only one thing, enlightened, values driven, extraordinary, effective leaders. Ali A. Mufuruki, circa 2013. Thank you so much to our panelists and to everyone else who has been commenting in the chat, but also for joining us on this journey. Asante uh, Nisana. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, uh, Catherine Rose. Uh, and thank you, panel, for um, the most wonderful and in, uh, in, insightful uh, conversation. That is Ali. That is what Ali founded in East Africa uh, many years ago. Um, I'm now conscious of time, and I would want us to go straight to uh, Mr. Francis Daniels. And uh, Mr. Daniels was introduced a little earlier as well by, by Dr. Moyo. Uh, he was, we were told he's an advisory board member of MITES, and of course he has his own organization, uh, Anibok Investment and Research Chambers, PTY. Uh, over to you, Francis, for if we could also now try and keep it a little, a little short because of time. Um, those who know me, Linus, thank you. Those who know me know that that was actually a wise warning. I shall, I shall heed it. Um, allow me to, um, um, I'll just make a few um, comments. Um, I met Ali through, um, Mines and Inkosana um, several, several years ago. <clears throat> and over the um, years, a couple of things stood out, many of which I've been pleased to see have been mentioned voluntarily by others. And I think the things that stood out for me was you could always chat and debate with Ali. Um, even if you had very different views, it was always a very civil um, 
and delightful discussion. He was a person whose word counted. I never knew Ali to say he would do something and not do it over, um, um, over the years. And it seems like such an um, a trite thing to say, but it is so unusual for somebody to go to their grave and for many people to feel that he was always a person of his, um, of his word. He was candid. You knew where you stood with Ali. Um, sometimes he expressed his candor artfully and I think uh, respectfully. And I always treasured his willingness to admit his um, errors. We saw an instance of that in the little video where he spoke after Professor Pra saying that about the distinction between race and uh, culture. And I was very surprised <clears throat> because I knew that Ali had um, spent, had lots of discussions with him on the subject of race. But listening to the way Professor Pra that evening spoke about culture, I could tell and subsequently in discussing with him had wrought a huge change. But what I admired was his expressing it publicly. Ali was a person of persistence and Minds was a beneficiary of that. Why do I say that? Because even though Minds started small and has had its journey, Ali was always there, always, always there. The second thing that fascinated me about Ali was his passion about an African identity formed out of composite elements, the Swahili, the South African cultures and others. And it fascinated me because he was an engineer, a scientist. The other person who has the same approach, which fascinates me is actually Dr. Moyo. They, they realized that there is a psychological and spiritual foundation necessary to be built properly for Africa to become a strong economy and polity. So there's a way in which all the things that the economists talk about, they never speak about the spirit, they never speak about heritage, they never speak about people's sensibilities, but all of those things and their morals count. Ali recognized that. And then the last thing that struck me was his determination to try to build networks of like-minded people with like-minded morals. We see it very clearly with, for example, the mafia. We see it clearly with some of the politicians. Ali set out to show to us that that was also something necessary for us who didn't belong to those um, categories. And it was a network he was trying to build, not characterized or limited by religion, not characterized or limited by culture, not characterized or limited by nationality. And those are things that we should um, cherish. I was amazed at his capacity to mix freely with politicians, with academics, and with ordinary people um, like us. Let me say to um, Sadi, I'm sorry that Ali has passed. And to the children, I'm sorry I haven't met you, but Ali mentioned you often to illustrate some of the concerns he had about heritage and the other things. So with that, all I can say is our lives will determine whether Ali has made a mark on us. And I hope that all of us will be able to say at the end that we walked in Ali's footsteps. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Mr. Daniels, for, for, for those words. I, actually, you managed to even save time. So whatever else they have said may not be true. Because you, you did save time. Um, That's good. You allow me to invite uh, a very close friend of, uh, of, of Ali, 
Actually, I met this gentleman because Ali had sent me to Ghana when he was uh, our, our, our director at Nation Media Group. And he kept on challenging us to look at ways in which we could expand to West Africa. And uh, he actually sent us to Ghana and sent us to this individual who is now the Minister for Finance of Ghana, Mr. Ken Poli Atta. Karibu sana. I believe Karibu sana is also uh, understood in West Africa. So Karibu sana. Uh, <laughs> sure is, Linus. It sure is. Um, difficult time, difficult moments. Um, but truly, I, I think um, Francis captured it. And just for full disclosure, Francis and I were in high school together from, for seven years. Um, and uh, we found a common friend in Ali from very different angles. Um, but truly, um, and as Francis said, uh, for me, Ali remains uh, a spirit, a spirit that is um, eternally edged in our hearts about this great continent of ours and how to, um, you know, fight the scourge of, of, of poverty and, and, and racism um, that, that we face. And, and I think um, for me, there are there's always um, a point in uh, our lives where the power to shape um, the opportunities um, for the citizens of, of this continent um, is given to very few people uh, in any generation. And the question becomes whether we will take the mantle um, for that. Uh, but in our sociology, it requires speaking um, truth to, to power. And that is not easy to do, especially in Africa, where sometimes we revere old age more than we should. And, and I think Ali, you know, epitomize uh, what we need to do um, to have the courage to really do what matters. And that is to speak truth um, so Ali, uh, in one of his um, famous um, speeches, and this was at the AU, um, wrote uh, about in Chrome. Uh, have we lost Mr. Atta? Hello. Is it just me? Can we hear him? Can you hear Mr. Atta? No, no, we can't hear him. No, we can't hear him. Yeah. No, we can't hear. I think we've lost we've lost him. He's still on the screen. Um, let's see. Let's give it a let's give it a minute. And let's see. Yes. And it's maybe whilst we're waiting, Dr. Ankosana Moyo wanted to rectify something quickly. Oh well, we can do that then. Yes. Uh, all I wanted to do was to formally uh, recognize Dr. Oduwale and uh, a couple of other colleagues who actually I hadn't noticed are on the call, Tariro and the Kasheko. I, if I've omitted anybody else from the MINDS team, I apologize, but those are the people I noticed that I had omitted. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Ofori Atta. Um, I think we will wait, we'll see. Uh, once we get a signal from him, we can uh, come back to him. Um, but I wanted to suggest that in the meantime, uh, in the interest of time, we'll still give Mr. Atta uh, uh, an opportunity. Like I said, he was a very, very close friend of, uh, of uh, Ali and he's a current Minister for Finance and Economic Planning in the Republic of Ghana. Uh, I would then suggest that we move to the panel and the a panel that is going to be moderated by Sanjay. Sanjay is a moderator in the CEO Rao Timbo of Tanzania. And uh, probably if I may call up you Sanjay and maybe you can introduce the, the rest of the panelists. Sanjay, you there? Yes, I am. And I'm sure you can hear me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Sanjay. I'm the chairman of the CEO Roundtable. 
Uh, I'm also the CEO for Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, I'm very privileged to be here and uh, talking to very, very close private sector leader friends of Ali. Uh, we have uh, Leonard Mususa, who actually has been with Ali in many different roles. Uh, he's a very significant private sector advocate, sits on many boards. Uh, we, had we have David Tarimo, who is the lead partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, and also you know, has contributed to many advocacy forums with uh, Ali. And we have uh, Hisham Hendi, the CEO for Vodacom, uh, and Ali actually was his chairman. So it's very interesting that you know, we'll be talking to private sector leaders in how they were influenced. Uh, if I may actually start uh, with uh, Leonard Mususa and, and, and you know, having, become, having taken over from Ali myself uh, as the chair of CEO Roundtable, as uh, I heard from Ralph, you know, I am constantly taking strength uh, from you know, how El Ali would view the future. Uh, I know you have constantly been with uh, Ali in many different roles as a great friend uh, and sometimes in many different roles. You know, I would like to see your reflections on, you know, what captivated you, what motivated you, how you really got encouraged, uh, but more importantly, what would be Ali's biggest voice for Africa from your perspective? Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, indeed, uh, I've known Ali uh, for quite a long time, I think uh, prior to 2000. Uh, but that was socially, and then uh, in the early part of 2000, uh, you know, sort of we probably got a little bit more involved uh, in the sort of advocacy role, uh, particularly when he invited me to uh, join as a founder member of uh, the CEO Roundtable. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I think uh, I was on the CEO Roundtable for quite a long time, uh, left a few years ago. Uh, in fact, at the time, uh, Ali had suggested that uh, I take over as chair, but then I said, look, you know, him and I had been on it for quite a long time. And maybe for an organization to, to, to uh, develop, to change, you need, you need a real change. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the names we settled for uh, as sort of possible replacement were similar. So, uh, so uh, Sanjay took over, uh, and I think he's demonstrated uh, that thinking was right. Uh, perhaps uh, the CEO roundtable wouldn't transform in the way it has uh, if somebody like me had stayed on uh, being a founder member with Ali. Uh, but what captivated me about Ali, and, and I think in the initial days, I also was involved in uh, really intellectual debates. You know, you couldn't avoid in any interaction with Ali to really get engaged at some stage in some intellectual debate. Uh, and he, he was captivating in a way because he always had a point of view that could be very different. Uh, and I found that very refreshing because uh, there's no point if uh, you know, you're always hearing similar things, you know, you hear about the same things. Uh, but you know, over time, uh, I came to depend on him, particularly when we, you know, in the early part of the 2000s, there was the East African community restarting, uh, really needing to get going. Uh, and initially, it was really just the uh, policymaker, the politicians, etc. And from a private sector perspective, it was important that our voice was heard, that we could influence the direction of the East African community, that we could make the regional grouping work for us. So that really uh, generated a need for a forum, a platform for discussion. Now, the way organization like the East African Business Council, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we conceive something different. Now, that was uh, a number of organizations coming together. I think there was uh, the Nation Media Group, PwC and uh, other professional organization coming together, to say, what should we do? So we had uh, an East African Business Summit. I mentioned East African Business Summit because I, from coming from Tanzania, I was very instrumental in organizing the part of Tanzania. And I depended on Ali, you know, I, I actually called on Ali many times to, and pulled him into panelist roles, into really 
provoking thought leadership, uh, leading panel discussions. So I learned a lot from Ali from really just his engagement in, in uh, particular when it came to talking about the role of private sector in influencing policy, not only in Tanzania, but going on to uh, uh, the bigger scene of East Africa. And a lot of things happened, uh, and I'm not quite sure I'm gonna get another chance, but I think uh, I'll give an example of uh, what this East African Business Summit did. In some of the discussions, we conceived uh, some important uh, transformation, no investments. Uh, at the time that we had one of these summits, there was, in, you know, communication was pretty bad and very expensive uh, to really have internet cost a lot of money. Uh, and uh, there wasn't a link, for example, between the Suez Canal and, and, and uh, South Africa. So that, that bit didn't have a cable. Uh, and one of the big discussions uh, in one of the summits was how do we enable that? Uh, it looked daunting because the amount of money was, uh, was, was quite large, but I think bringing all those minds together, uh, you know, the likes of Ali Mufuruki, and you should have seen him in, you know, in those discussions, uh, influenced the way we mapped out uh, what could be done. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the less is history, because we ended up with a cable that connected uh, north to south. Uh, north to south, and now internet communications are much cheaper. Even telephone communications are much cheaper than they used to be. So mm -hmm. an amazing man. I wish I had the sort of uh, energy that he had. Uh, I often wondered how many hours he had, maybe had extra hours because uh, you know, the amount of you know, work he would do in a day, uh, I don't think it was easy for anybody to do. Uh, you said early, you know, I, I'm, I let very work, I, I work very late. So you send early a note, uh, a query at about close to midnight and you get an answer. So I'll then sort of uh, start wondering, you know, how does he do it? Uh, and his willingness to come forward to, to uh, engage uh, in uh, thought leadership, etc. Uh, to the extent that I think a lot of us know him because he was also there, you know, in dialogue with us at various platforms, contributing fantastic ideas on, on what could be done on, to develop the continent. Uh, so amazing man. And I, I imagine if we had several Ali Mufuruki types on the continent, imagine if we had those, uh, I think that's what we need to accelerate the development of the continent. Uh, maybe I pause there for a while because I could go on for quite a while. Mm. Thank you, Leonard. And uh, if I can move on to David Terimo. Uh, David, I won't get into the whole question, but I just want to say your big reflections uh, having spent time with uh, Ali. Um, so I think the first I got to know uh, or deal with him was interactions with CEO Rand Table. Um, and that was really a catalyst for government and private sector to work a lot closer uh, together. He was one of the founder members there and he'd always taken a strong um, part in, in leading those discussions uh, and debates. And I know we've heard a lot about the, the Africa uh, view and, and, and vision uh, for Ali. And I think the sort of um, communication that he drove and, and, and so on, on, on the Tanzania front and, and later on the Africa front is really the message we need to absorb as we look to better integrate um, Africa. I think we heard from uh, Mama Michelle, uh, both about the, the challenges, um, I think really around mindset and really how do we break out of borders that were put there by uh, Berlin. And yet that, that is the, the real imperative if we're gonna grow our economies, uh, but also the opportunity in terms of communication. And I think that's what he really did quite seamlessly moving between the private sector and business, um, sorry, and government uh, and, and somehow managing to bring the two um, together. So that, that's sort of my uh, abiding memory as someone very focused on the policy side. Thanks. Hisham, you spend time with a very young, dynamic, socially native chairman. <laughs> what are your reflections as the CEO of Vodacom? 
Thank you, Sanjay. And first, uh, just thanks very much for arranging for this event and uh, a special thanks to Ali's family for inviting him to be part of this. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Well, I'm sure a lot of you would be keen to hear about uh, Ali's uh, uh, time with Vodacom. I mean, honestly, we, we all miss him a lot. Uh, on behalf of you know, Vodacom Tanzania, I mean, uh, this is a, a great pleasure to be here today. And, and again, Ali, uh, during uh, his time you know, with us, uh, with me personally, uh, he would always be uh, super supportive uh, to our uh, board and the company. Uh, I can't remember a time uh, that I called him and uh, he never picked up. He always picks up the phone. He always answers my WhatsApps. Uh, uh, when it comes to board meetings, I mean, very strictly on time, you know, uh, getting the meetings in order, consistency uh, in, in, in all the matters. But one thing I would, I would always remember is uh, how he used to challenge uh, us as, as board directors and really uh, he, 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 he had a very, uh, he, he is an opinionated person and he always had an opinion about uh, technology and, and uh, the importance of uh, expanding the technology in Tanzania. And uh, for him, uh, I think uh, being the chairman of Vodacom Tanzania, it wasn't just uh, a chairman role. I mean, he really kind of, you know, tried to push his uh, his thoughts and ideas and, you know, in expanding our network because he believed in technology. He believed in how important uh, mobile money is to the country and, and always, you know, challenging uh, us and our investments and in bringing the latest technology uh, to Tanzania and, and uh, really uh, an amazing uh, character to deal with and uh, always uh, supportive when it comes to, you know, uh, dealing with uh, diff different regulatory bodies, and uh, giving us thoughts and ideas around, you know, policies when it comes to telecommunications. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, it, it was a, a great pleasure working with him. He advised me personally in a lot of uh, things when it comes to leadership and how important uh, it is uh, to become, uh, 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 you know, a symbol for uh, the country because a lot of people will not remember you uh, for what you your targets are in numbers, but how uh, you are as a, as a, as a person uh, dealing with you know with your staff with the people with the stakeholders and 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 the really uh, great advices that I got from him. So yeah, I can go on uh, for for a long time, but for the interest of time, uh, I, I would leave the rest of the uh, panelists to continue as well. Thanks. And uh, on a lighter note, uh, Hisham, he was telling us how impressed you were about his knowledge about GPS, not knowing that he was talking about golf, private sector, and scale rather than the GPS that you are used to. Uh, just, you know, in the interest of time, uh, just last words from, uh, you know, Leonard Mususa, then I get to Tarimo and then Hisham. Look, uh, Leonard Mususa, you are muted. Okay, yeah, thanks. Right. So I think, uh, like I said before, I think uh, we as a community, we as private sector, we really need to, embrace that early spirit. Uh, because I think there's a tendency for a lot of people to sit back and let uh, the politicians run with it. Uh, we need to be at the table. We need to be engaged, spend our own time. Because I think Ali spent a lot of his time and money to really uh, accept invitations or these uh, forums uh, and, and, and really sort of uh, make great contributions. And that's why we have been enriched by his uh, short life. Uh, you know, I think he was able to forge meaningful relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, there's one that has is probably make a different a change in my life uh, forever. When I retired, uh, obviously any investments I had were my own. I, you know, I wasn't doing anything with anybody else. Uh, and then he brought me together with uh, a group of people. Uh, that are from East Africa. Basically, we have people from Rwanda, we have people from Kenya, people from Uganda and Tanzania coming together to pool our resources together and try and work on uh, investments going forward. And we look at this as a, something of a generation. I think it's in true spirit 
of uh, what he wanted to see Africa develop, not as little countries doing their own things, but coming together as Africa, as private sector across the uh, region, pulling our resources together and making a difference. So I hope something that we can take away uh, now is each one of us to think, you know, how do we make a difference? We need to really use our own time to make a difference. It won't happen unless we engage, unless we make sure we are represented in the right fora and prepared to engage and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Msusa. Jumping on to David Tarimo. If it was the Ali way, what are your reflections? Um, I, I think at the end of the day, I'd, I'd echo much of what uh, Leonard has just said and others. It's around, uh, if we are to live that legacy, it's also, are we gonna put ourselves out the same way that he did, um, you know, for the betterment of, of uh, the, the, the wider uh, community? Listening to some of the narrative about him, um, you know, at whatever time being available reminds me, I'm, I'm on a WhatsApp group that involves quite a lot of senior influencers and policymakers, ministers, but also senior Tanzanian business officials. And I was amazed at how much time Ali would spend contributing. However much the conversation was going in a direction he did not want, he would try and... Uh, guide it back uh, to where he thought the thinking um, should be. And I think, you know, certainly as business leaders, we are always, by definition, uh, busy. It's very easy to isolate yourself in your own little hole, but uh, I think we all have that wider responsibility um, to set the foundation for the next generation. And I think that's, you know, that's what he did in terms of his thinking, particularly on the um, regional uh, perspective. Yes, he was Tanzanian, but he's very much East African uh, and, and African. So I think the the challenge to us is for us to continue to live that that legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, Hisham, you know the man who believed in tech for prosperity. Yeah, no, look, I think for for me, uh, Sanjay, the the, the the couple two two things here. I, I would say a reflection that I would remember. You know, when we used to talk a lot about the impact of uh, technology on the economy and we used to talk about digital economy, Ali used to always ask me like, Kisham, you know what, not, not everybody works for Vodacom, so you really need to uh, simplify what does it mean about this whole digital economy? I mean, we could understand it, but you know, you need to simplify it and you need to make sure that, that you simplify it. And then I always kind of remember that in, in a lot of the forums and I, and I, and, I, and I tried as much as I can to simplify it in, in different manners. And, 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 and right now we reach to three major points on, on, on how to really simplify you know, digital economy, which is about connectivity and making it the best foundation. And secondly, you know, higher penetration of access of devices. And thirdly, embracing innovation and, and enabling you know, the technical and digital ecosystem to work for, for the ecosystem of the country. And, and obviously under each one of those, we can, we can dwell a lot, but I mean, we reached into uh, three simple points where we can talk uh, about them to, you know, uh, different forums and different areas, but his inspiration towards simplifying that was, was, was amazing just to ensure that if you want to embrace technology in the different African countries, you need to ensure that not everyone understands the technology. So you need to simplify and make them uh, uh, love it. And, and the second reflection, uh, Sanjay, was around uh, education, right? Uh, uh, I mean, you know, a uh, big part of the ch chairman role was around managing our annual general meeting. I remember in our AGMs, uh, it was very hard for the individual shareholders to really, you know, understand the details of how the stock market works, you know, the, 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 the share price and so on and so forth. So we, the, the meetings used to be prolonged because of a lot of questions that are not relevant to the annual general meeting. So, so he said, guys, you know, we have a responsibility to educate those as individuals. If they all come one meeting for, for this annual general meeting once a year, why don't we make it and two or three hours earlier and set a session with the Dar Salaam Stock Exchange where we could educate them? And let's just do that. It's, it's part of our responsibility. And honestly, it was amazing and inspiring that 
we actually did it. And then, then the next AGM went very smoothly because people truly understood uh, how things uh, work. He was really genuine in terms of, you know, uh, education. And this is one example, but just to show that education was a big part of uh, his thoughts and ideas and ideologies to really uh, ensure that generations, uh, uh, you know, prosper and, 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 and evolve uh, in the way uh, they, they live uh, their lives. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it was, uh, again, those are my uh, summarized uh, reflections, uh, Sanjay. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, just as Catherine did, I think my last quote is going to be from David Tarimo. His last words on Ali were not just in terms of vision, but also courage and also conviction. Ali was a man for all seasons. He was equally comfortable in the village, equally comfortable in the boardroom, and equally comfortable in the global stage. And I hope every African can be so. Thank you. Back to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sajay. I first want to just check whether Ken Ofori at all is there, because we really, really would want to hear from you. I confirm that it is power that went off uh, when we lost the uh, uh, Ken, are you there? Mr. Ofori Atta, are you there? Oh, that's sad. That's sad. We would not, not hear from Ken. It has oh, to be is Africa. It? Power has to go out at some stage. Eh? Yeah, it went off. Uh, that, I got a <laughs> message that his power that went off, but he came back on, actually. Uh, yeah. But uh, in the middle of this other conversation. So that's, that's unfortunate. But uh, he did say that he'll call the family later in the week. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, could we then move on to the next item uh, where we actually, actually the next item is uh, Sajay himself. Sajay, you are going to give uh, 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 a, a tribute. Certainly. Uh, and I'm yeah. going to try and make it short. So I think because a lot has already spoken about Ali, it's always difficult when you're speaking late, but uh, we're talking about a miracle in our life. And let me just start by saying, you know, it's a blessing to see his family and it's a blessing to see them in a good spirit. Uh, those words that the daughter spoke were very deep. I think we all as friends are very, very privileged to have Ali in our life. Um, we in Tanzania claim him to be a Tanzanian, but I think we are also proud that he is a son of this continent. Uh, as an African leader, I think what is exciting is that, you know, he got to a stature where all of us, you know, have a piece of him and many, many, many Africans have a piece of him, which will continue to, you know, prosper us in its own way long after he's gone, which is amazing. Um, for me, he was an incredibly wise man, an amazing storyteller, you know, super convincing. That's why I've taken over the role from him because he did tell me too many stories. And I think that he was great, great at his intellect, very generous, a super gentleman, and a very decent human being. What was amazing, uh, having heard the daughters, was how consistent he was, whether he was talking to the private sector, to the professionals, to the youth, or to the family, speaks volumes about his character as an individual. I think, you know, we all know that Ali was super digitally, socially native. And I think he gave, he gave us too many pictures and stories from all his trips, uh, but also from all his engagements. So if there is one thing we can all learn is to do a little bit more about that because sharing is not only caring, but Ali taught us that sharing is also learning together. So I hope that we can do that. For me, he was one of the most bravest leader I have ever met. And I think he, he left us that braveness with many of us. Uh, his daughter said he was beautifully unreasonable. I think we all know that he was so many times impatient, but impatient for the right things. Uh, so where I, as, as I'm reflecting on Ali, I think one of the biggest things he's left for Tanzania is the CEO Roundtable, where he was the founding member. The CEO Roundtable was formed in the year 2000 ex by this very extremely passionate individual leader. It is all about private public sector partnerships, 
it's about transparency, it's about productivity. The CEO roundtable is much more about ethics and what we all as leaders should stand for. You know, ethics as a private sector, ethics as a nation, ethics as a continent. And I think we heard many things that were linked to that. But also what was amazing was the amount of time he spent just talking about sustainability and contributing to it uh, and also nurturing talent, you know, whether it is senior leaders or the young, junior leaders. Uh, as just, you know, as I mentioned in my, my memorial, you know, after Ali passed away, you know, for me, what was amazing is I had not spent a lot of time with him, but every time I spent with him, which was very little, so it is about quantity, not, it, it is about quality, not quantity. He left something with me. And I remember he gave me a call once and, and, and told me that Sanjay, I want to see you. And when I met him, he said, you know, we have decided. He said, we have decided. I said, what have you decided? He said, we have decided you're going to take over as the chairman from me. And I just looked at him and I told him, Ali, how is somebody supposed to fill in your shoes? And he turned back and said, Sanjay, who told you that you're supposed to fill in my shoes? You're supposed to create your own shoes. That's what every African leader should do. I think those words will never go away from my life. And I was incredibly touched. It was interesting that uh, his daughter said that, you know, whilst he was in Vancouver, he flew in for two days into Toronto to see her and spend time with her. Even in those two days, he spent time with my son who was in Toronto. Um, I can tell you my family is super touched. My daughter actually bought this today for me, said this is the best thing you can wear as a Tanzanian scarf uh, to, to really respect him. It tells you how much he connected with my family, even with the very, very tiny time he spent uh, with them. For me, if I have to tell you what are the most important takeaways I have from a leadership perspective, and I think I did take time to, to pen them down in one time, but I still wanna share a few of them. Uh, because they are very important for African leaders. Ali taught me that leadership arises not from your position, but from your actions. Ali taught me that private sector partici participation is the premise of prosperity in every nation. And I remember that even in Tanzania, he was bold to say that after all, 98% of the population of Tanzania is private sector. So how can we actually ignore it? And that's true for every other country because the government and the number of people you know, who are employed by the government are technically very, very limited. Ali taught me that change cannot happen alone. It is about purposeful collaboration. And I think we all heard so much more about it, creating one voice, tiny, tiny voice that makes it a bigger voice. Ali taught me most importantly, use your power wisely to uplift. If you are blessed with power, you have to use it to uplift. Ali taught me, you are in the business of people. Invest in them to make them fit for purpose and growth. That's what Africans need. And finally, Ali told me that as human beings and leaders, our goal can never be to live forever, but to live something that impacts life forever. And we being together today, I think, you know, testifies that that is what, what Ali was all about. Finally, as I close, you know, I actually have a confession. At Ali's memorial, I said Ali cheated me. Ali cheated me to take on a role. And he had also told me that as you are taking on the role, I will be with you. I will nurture you. I will coach you. Today, I just want to say in my confession that Ali, I know at that time I felt bad because you left me, but you have left so many voices with me. You have left so many friends with me. You have left so many experiences with me and you have created a different voice for me. Sorry, Ali, you did not cheat me, you elevated me. For the family, God bless you all. And it's wonderful to be able to speak for Ali. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for that. Um, again, speaking from the heart about your experience and relationship 
with Ali. Uh, I think we've got two or three items left. Uh, we've got some sort of conversation about where do we go from here? Uh, some of the conclusions and we forward and, we, and then of course we'll have the vote of thanks. Um, I want us to start with the conclusions and way forward. And I know uh, we've down, got down on the program, um, um, Zuhura, Zuhura Muro, again, another very close friend of the family. And uh, Zuhura has also been our chairman of uh, Monanchi Communications. And I know she had agreed with um, uh, Santina that she was going to do that. But Zuhura, over to you. T tell me how you want us to play this. There we are. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Linus, uh, for moderating this very important uh, session. I have really learned a lot from all the colleagues and friends of Ali, and especially seeing the children are uh, being close to them since Ali passed. And I'm so grateful to God that they are developing well, and they are mm. a great source of comfort to their mom. To Sophie and uh, Zahra, Leila, and uh, Abu Razak, thank you very much for being a joy since then. Uh, yes, we divided this particular portion because I was also thrown out. I'm not in a place where we have very good connection with Santina. Santina will provide the way forward. I'm going to just give a short tribute and then hand it over to Santina Linus. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. I'll like start with the tribute of Ali to Ali by saying, um, from Allah, we come and to Allah is our return. And this is what we believe. May Allah continue to shower Ali's soul with the choicest blessings. May Allah again grant Ali soul a grand reception in paradise. In Islam, faith tradition. We believe that every soul is created to fulfill a certain purpose in this particular world. And Ali, he followed the Islam faith tradition throughout his life. Interacting with him as a friend, but more deeply in the later years as a big brother and a mentor and working with Ali very closely, especially when we started the Africa Leadership Initiative. I realized that this man was in a, on a mission. He led a purposeful life that transcended his physical presence. This afternoon we are here, it is a testimony of that purposeful life that he led. And when I remember the way he was carrying out his leadership role with passion and love, it reminded me of the awareness that God wants us to have. And Ali had that kind of awareness. In the short poem that uh, his daughter Sophie read today, testified this. He had deep understanding that his time in this dimension of life was measured by his creator. So he invested himself so passionately and so generously to empower other people who came to his space without any discrimination, without any hope for gaining something from these people. But for him, humanity was the primary call for his life. I see him as pragmatist and optimist. When some of us were giving up on Africa, he will come out with a very optimistic view of where Africa is going. And when I remember the many readings that we read in the leadership sessions, one which really strike me so closely and many of my fellows will remember, it is the reading which was written by Lanisius Anisius Seneca and the title was On the Shortness of Life. 
the particular passage that I want to remember and to reflect today in this tribute, it reads like this, and I quote, it is not that we have a short space of time, but that we waste much of it. Life is long enough, and it has been given insufficiently generously measure to allow the accomplishment of the very greatness things, if the whole of it is well invested. I close the court. So this particular passage epitomizes what Ali stood for. He was everything for every one of us. He loved humanity. He wanted to invest himself in creating a difference in humanity. He was optimistic with humanity and he worked so hard to ensure that it happens. And in the faith tradition that Ali followed, we believe that a soul continue to, re to receive rewards after its life in this planet for the goodness that it has created, for the footsteps that it has left on the people, the society that the soul was given a privilege to live in. And what I'm seeing today, it is a testimony of that kind of reward. And I believe Allah is rewarding my brother Ali, our friend Ali, our business associate Ali, with many rewards because his work is being celebrated. And there are many institutions that would like to keep his thought leadership alive and continue the work that he has done. To Sada and the children, we believe we are going to work together. You are going to give us a lot of things that your dad had already written and they have not come to the public, for, uh, public space so that the generations to come continue to learn from Ali, the greatest leader of our time, a phenomenal man. May Allah bless your soul. Rest in peace, my brother. Thank you, Linus. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Zuhura. Uh, I know you're very close to the family and uh, you talk from the heart and from personal testimony. Uh, over to you, uh, Santina. Um, thank you very much, Linus. Um, thank you to all who have come here to celebrate the life of Ali Furuki. Uh, thank you so much to the Mfuki family um, and specifically Zara and Sophia for sharing such deep and personal insights into Ali Mfuki as a father. And thank you to Minds for bringing us together. Um, I think I've been given maybe a very challenging role by Mazura to try and uh, quickly summarize uh, all the amazing and deep insights that we've heard um, today. Um, so maybe if I can start uh, with uh, what we heard from Mama Grasha Michelle. Uh, the chair of Minds, um, who really reminded us that today is not simply an event, but the start of continued reflections, continued sharing of lessons learned from Ali's life and how we can continue to work to engage Africa's future leaders, working to inspire and referencing his thinking to ensure that we transform our nations, our continent and the world. Uh, Dr. Moyo also reminded us on the importance of having a balanced view and embracing our place in the global space as we continue uh, the journey that Ali started. We heard from uh, a number of um, African Leadership Initiative, the Ali Fellows, um, on leadership challenges and lessons learned from the continent. And we heard some insights on uh, the importance of virtue in leadership. Uh, we heard on the role of networks and working together towards a common uh, cause. And maybe today is a, an excellent example of uh, the power of how Ali's networks um, are clearly bigger than even any one personality bringing so many different uh, people today uh, together. Um, we also I heard some ideas in terms of what needs to be done to tackle Africa's existing leadership challenges. Um, how do we ensure that we understanding and uh, build a deeper understanding of where we come from? 
Um, how do we work towards moving away from being commentators and actually people of action and leadership by example and finding the, the necessary courage to do what actually matters? Um, we then heard from uh, the CEO Roundtable um, in terms of uh, positioning the private sector in developing the con uh, continent, highlighting some of Ali's work um, where he really um, worked towards enhancing the role of the private sector and bringing together uh, quite a significant network of CEOs uh, looking at providing a forum that could work as a catalyst for enhanced engagement with government and continued influencing of policy so critical to um, Africa's uh, economic development as well. We've heard so many words um, and, and personal uh, tributes uh, today, uh, many words to describe Ali Furuki, many that were repeated throughout the course of the session today. Um, some of the ones that I've captured, deeply principled, a man of great humility, um, an ethical leadership champion, uh, working with service in leadership, uh, self-discipline, diligence, intimidating but approachable. I personally ve very much resonated with, with that one that um, Zara shared. Uh, from my uh, work with Ali Furuki, um, he was my chair as, as I was executive director of the CEO Roundtable. So where I am today, I think is a, also a huge testament to um, his continued mentoring and um, coaching um, from my journey as well. We also heard that he was such a captivating storyteller and um, maybe most profound, a visionary and strategic thinker. Um, we know that today will not be the uh, just an event, as I said earlier. We are looking towards for continued uh, discussion. Um, we're going to uh, look forward to Minds hosting a regional discussion next year in 2021. And given that um, Alim Fuki was so passionate about uh, the African continent free trade area, the first dialogue will really focus on that. As so in terms of a way forward, uh, let's continue to come together with, within our networks um, and continue to explore the ways in which we can continue Alim Fuki's uh, journey. So maybe finally, um, Alim Fuki was a father, a brother, a friend, a mentor. Um, and so much to, to many more who, are, who maybe were not able to join us today. But even this platform today is, I think is a great testament to the massive impact that he's had and will continue to have on the lives of so many. And finally, in closing, um, Sophia, if I may borrow from your words, um, may the seeds that he planted in our hearts and minds continue to grow. Rest in peace, Ali Furuki, you are very much missed and your legacy lives on. Thank you so much. Thank you, God bless, and thank you, Linus. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that uh, uh, summary. Uh, and uh, as we come to a close, and as I ask uh, um, uh, Gilman Kasiga to get ready for a vote of thanks, I am just reflecting that Ali was committed to creating a better society, a more equitable, value-based society where no one is left behind. And I think the question is, how do we take that forward in our individual spaces, in our ecosystems? Ari was committed to looking deep down to who we really are. Uh, like they say, um, and I say this in Swahili, Mkosamira ni mtumwa, and I hope I got that right, Suhura. Mkosamira ni mtumwa. Mkosadira. Mkosadira. Yeah, the, who does not have his own or value his culture is a stranger or a foreigner. Ari was committed to being great inside out, uh, starting with himself, uh, his family, as we have seen the testimonies from the, from, the, from the ladies, the young ladies, and then to the world. And he devoted huge amounts of time for public good, because all the conversations we've been having here this evening is not what car he drove or how big a business he built, uh, not what, it's really how much he spent time touching lives and trying to make a difference at the individual level, at the community level, at the country level, even at the continent level. And leads me to how to read this quote uh, as I close by Love Wilder Emerson, which says, to love often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, 
to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy house, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. And I want to say, Ali was immensely successful in that way. And may his soul rest in peace, in eternal peace. Over to you, uh, Gilman. Thank you, Linus. Uh, before I move a vote of thanks, I would like to say a few uh, words about uh, Ali. I'll be very brief because much has been said. Um, Ali was a brother to me, more than a friend. We shared a lot and uh, I really miss him, terribly miss him. And um, he was so connected that uh, I remember during my son's uh, high school graduation, Ali came to this event and they gave my son an envelope and look what was in this envelope. It was a letter to my son. And it would have been very easy for Ali to just put some money in there, but he dedicated his time to write, to, to, to write a letter to my son. I thought that was very powerful. Ali was a, was a fighter. Uh, I remember him sharing a story during his, um, in his early 20s while in Germany. He was diagnosed uh, uh, with a life-threatening condition and the doctors gave him a few months to live. And uh, Ali said, no, I'm not gonna die. This is not gonna happen. And they looked at the doctor and said, fine, I'll continue with my life. And uh, you can't believe he lived more than 35 years beyond the time which was uh, the doctors had given him. And in the process he met Sada and uh, together they developed, I mean, they, they have this uh, incredibly beautiful family uh, you have witnessed during this session. Mm. He, he do, but a few days before he died, I in his in in, in his in, in the hospital, I told me that GK, we are losing this battle. Those are very powerful words, and I couldn't believe what, that, what was hearing. And I encouraged him that no, you you've won many battles. I'm sure this is not gonna be uh, we'll overcome this as well. But uh, that that happened, and we know what happened. But uh, he was such a fighter. Uh, he worked so much, even when he was unwell, but he found time to, to, to share his, the moments as you all been describing about the conference and what he dedicated himself to his work. So he was very consistent uh, person. And uh, we have something we call in the game of golf called uh, follow through, that you follow through a, a situation until he get what he wanted or achieve the results he was uh, uh, pursu pursu pursuing. I remember when we wrote, we were we were writing a book, Ali with uh, Moren Mara and Rahim Mauj and I co-authored a book on Tanzania's industrialization journey. It's because of Ali's consistency and the follow through, we are able to put this project together and uh, uh, and write a, a, a book and. Uh, with we are all of us being first time authors. And he also has this uh, photo memory, as you just, uh, somebody has alluded, he was writing a memoir before he died and they shared some of the stories of what he was going to put in this memoir. And I could not believe the level of memory of, I see, of stories he remembered and he was putting down. And I hope this project will be completed by the family for us to, to, uh, to, to share and, uh, uh, and know his thoughts. He, he was this candid person to the extent that uh, uh, he, 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 he didn't go well with people with, uh, who are very economical with, uh, with the truth. <laughs> the other person which has not been mentioned here is uh, Ali's charitable work. He did a lot of charity and they never talked about it. And I think that is so, so much to remember about him, him and the Sada. I'm sure whoever Ali is, is very happy that this event is happening and we are here to honor him and celebrate his life. And on that note, I would like to move a vote of thanks and 
and to thank a few people who helped to put this uh, event together. I'd like to thank the Mfruki family and daughters, Leila and Zara, for assisting in uh, organizing this event yeah, and prepare, particularly coordinating the rest of us in the family and the yeah, friends. Man. Yes. Yeah, man. Just a quick one. Uh, sorry, sorry to come after I thought I had finished. I notice and I've been told that Yvonne Chaka Chaka is in the house. Uh, maybe she can just say one word for one minute. I've been asked uh, by several people who've been sending me messages to acknowledge her and ask her maybe to just say one word and then back to you. Yvonne, are you in the house? Thank you. Yvonne? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for granting me this. To Ali's family and his children and uh, to the whole of Africa, I just want to say he was a great man. He was a brother. He was a great leader. And, uh, you know, he's done what Allah had asked him to come and do. He's ran his race. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Moyo and Mama Grasa who introduced me to Ali. And uh, I think we need to make sure that we continue his legacy because he was just one of those greatest leaders. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. And back to you, Gimon. Back to you, Gimon. Hello. Gilman. Uh, can, you, can anybody tell whether Gilman is uh, muted or something? Sorry, I'm back. Sorry, sorry, Lennart, I'm back. Thank you. Yes. So I would like to thank the following people. First of all, as I said, the Mufruki family, the daughters, Rayla and Sarah, for assisting putting this event together and making sure all, we are all coordinated. I would also like to thank the, the Minds team for putting this event together in honor of uh, the board member in Ali. I would like to thank Mr. Francis uh, Daniel for his support. And uh, this event was supposed to be uh, in Dar es Salaam. And there are several companies which are committed to, to sponsor this, uh, uh, this event. So I would like to thank those companies that had uh, were willing to support uh, to, to support this event if it was being held in Dar es Salaam. And um, as you know, we had to change and uh, move to a virtual event. And uh, I really appreciate their willingness to support had it gone ahead to be held in Dar es Salaam. I would like to thank uh, Mr. David Kawa for bringing all the contacts together in providing guidance in preparing this uh, session today. I'd also like to thank the film crew for the incredible work of putting together a lovely video for, for Ali. I'd also like to thank uh, Amanda Sibia for designing the invitation. You all saw the invitation card, it was lovely, it was very beautiful, we admired. And the most importantly, I would like to thank all the participants of this event for putting aside some time on this uh, uh, weekend and be with us here. Thank you very much and back to you, Linus. Thank you very much. What else can I say? Asante Nisana, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you again to the family for, 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 for allowing this to happen. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Asante, thank you. God bless you. And uh, we now uh, declare the, the gathering uh, finished. Thank you for a very great moderation, Linus. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Linus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Bye -bye.
Bye, bye, everyone, and thank you for putting bye. this together. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Zara, Zara, we need the U of T connection to happen. That's still outstanding. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. God bless you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you, Uncle Lionel. Thank you so much. Asante Sana. Uncle Lionel, thank you so much. You did so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. That's the least we can do for a great man. Yeah. And a great family, quite frankly.